going to kick this off. A good second uh, session of the data privacy training uh, as organized by the ELS Institute. Uh, as we did last week, uh, our trainers uh, are still the same. Our moderator is Ms. Annabelle Mwesije, uh, and our facilitator, the expert in this area, is Mr. Lawrence uh, Dinger, who will take us through the next uh, two hours. Uh, I'm not the main speaker, so I'm going David, maybe turn off your video so that uh, you, you find it easier to. Annabelle uh, and ask her to facilitate her to take us uh, through the session. Thank you. Annabelle. If Thank you, David. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Annabelle and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, we are kicking off our second, the, the second part of our three parts um, webinar series. Um, uh, this today's session is on privacy governance. Um, if you remember last week, we had our very first session, which was an introduction to privacy program management, also led by Mr. Loris Dinga. He was our speaker the last time. If you weren't able to, to join us last week, I will reintroduce him so that you are more conversant with our speaker for the day. Uh, just briefly give us um, an explanation, more context of what we are we are discussing today. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, our session is on privacy governance, and this session will major main on this uh, be a discussion on governance framework for establishing a successful and strong privacy program within an enterprise, and that will give components or that guide the privacy function towards compliance with privacy laws and regulations and enable it to support the organization's broader business objectives and goals. Um, our speaker for today is Mr. Loris Dinga. He's a seasoned international cybersecurity consultant with a wealth of experience and expertise in cybersecurity, uh, privacy and digital forensics and capacity building. I hope you can hear me. The last time the people mentioned that they couldn't hear me. Uh, he can. trains legal professions, yes. He, he, he trains legal professionals, including lawyers, prosecutors, magistrates, and judges in areas of cybersecurity, cybercrime, electronic evidence, and digital forensics. Sir Lawrence is a, an advocate consultant for the cybercrime program. Um, Mr. Lawrence is an approved consultant for the cybercrime program office of the Council of Europe on law enforcement and judicial training in cybercrime and electronic evidence. Lawrence is also a consultant for the European Union Agency of Law Enforcement Training on cybercrime attacks against information. He's a digital forensics expert witness in court and has testified in many cases of cybersecurity and digital forensics. Mr. Lawrence holds a Master's in Science in Forensic Computing and Security from the University of Derby. England and an LLM in ICT law from Open University of Tanzania and diploma in law from the Kenya School of Law and this is also a certified information system security uh, a professional. Mr. Dinga has expensive IT consultancy and cyber capacity building experience in EMEA in the EMEA region and is the founder and CEO of Manage, manage, manage Com System Limited in a leading cybersecurity and digital forensics consulting service provider in Africa. Manage Com Systems Limited strives to deliver a state of the art cybersecurity and digital forensics products and solutions and services to individuals, corporate entities, and law enforcement across Africa. Please help me welcome Mr. Loris Finger. Uh, thank you, thank you, Annabelle, for the intro. intro. And uh, I'll just uh, go straight into the presentation. Now, let me just, um, what I'm going to do is uh, for, the, for the sake of the guys who are not there last week, I'm just going to do a recap of what we did. Then uh, <clears throat> we can get into what we want to do today. 
So let me just share my screen. I think everybody will be able to see my screen. Can you see my screen? Hope everybody able to see my screen. So last time we were talking about privacy and we introduced what the pri what privacy is and what we said is that privacy is something which is a fundamental right enshrined in numerous uh, international uh, human rights instruments, including Kenyan constitution, which is uh, uh, you can find the issue of privacy in Article 31, uh, which has got um, uh, four bullets that you can see A to A, A to D. And uh, you can see that um, when we are talking about privacy, there are two aspects of privacy, the physical privacy, when we talk about uh, people, their person, home or uh, property searched, their, their, their possession uh, seized. And then in number C, you can see that information related to their family and private affairs are necessarily uh, required or revealed. And then there's also the issue of um um uh, privacy on their communications in french which means that if you look at c and d so when we are talking about uh, bullet c and d we are talking about more about data privacy that is information privacy uh making sure that information relating to your family or to your private affairs is not unnecessarily required or revealed all your communications is not infringed so if you look at this from the uh, from uh, 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 this point, you can see that when we talk about privacy, we are more talking about. Uh, let me just see if I can do this. Uh, I don't know why I keep it keeps just uh, just a minute, minute please. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thank you uh, for your patience. Now, <clears throat> now, if you can see from an enterprise point of view, uh, when we talk about privacy, we are talking about data privacy, and we are talking about protection of personally identifiable information. That is all about what we're talking about in this context of enterprise. We are not talking about uh, physical privacy. We are talking more about um, uh, information privacy. And when we talk about information privacy, we are talking about info, uh, personally identifiable information. Now, if we talk about uh, personally identifiable information, what is personally identifiable inform information? That is PII. That is any information that can be used to identify a subject to whom such information relates, or it, it can be used um, or might be used, uh, might be directly or indirectly linked to a subject, which means that even if that information cannot directly identify that particular individual, but that information can be linked with another information and you'll be able to identify this individual. So that is what we call the personally identifiable information. And that is what all is all uh, privacy is all about. Now, privacy in the context of the, pri uh, of the of PII uh, uh, has two components here. We are talking about the, 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 the proper collection handling, management, and use of personal information. And then we are talking about protecting that particular personal information. So if you look at this, uh, the, the two aspect of uh, components of PII, then we see that on the first one, we talk about the way we talk about the proper collection, handling, and management of uh, and, and use of personal information. It is more of data governance, uh, how the data is used within the, the organization, the processes, the standards, what, the, 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 what you use to make sure that that data is used uh, in appropriate manner. Then the second aspect, which we are talking about um, um, uh, protection of personal information, that there we are talking about cybersecurity, which means that how do we now have in place uh, processes and organization, techni technical organization, uh, uh tools to protect that in that personal personally identifiable information from being breached by an outsider so we also talked about 
privacy management and that is what that was the, the, the topic of the first session that is what is privacy management because you need to within and the uh, within the enterprise you need to manage this this privacy so what is this privacy management because this is what is going to help you make sure that your privacy uh, the, the data uh, privacy is properly managed now the privacy management we say that it is a structured approach of combining several disciplines into a framework that allows an organization to meet legal compliance requirements and the expectation of business clients or uh, uh, customer while reducing the, the the risk of a data breach now here you can see that when we talk about privacy man program management is an overarching uh, pro, um, uh, program. It is. It, it is at the top. It is. It. it, 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 it you. You bring together several disciplines into a framework, and this is what all uh, is all about the uh, privacy framework and uh, uh, privacy program management. Now, what? What is the, the? What are some of the advantages? Or what are some of the key uh, benefits of uh, managing your privacy? within the enterprise first of all it promotes consumer trust and confidence is if uh, you you keep people's data and uh, they they are sure that their data is well kept and is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, secure then you, in that case you'll have the trust and confidence of the consumers now you just uh, imagine a situation where you have a bank account at KCB or whichever bank you have. And then tomorrow you hear that uh, hackers hacked uh, KCB bank and amount of such amount of money is, is has been uh, has been stolen. You know, this, which means that the uh, that particular bank does not uh, uh, have in place proper uh, um, uh, security measures that can be able to pro protect the consumer and then that means that the consumers will lose confidence, trust and confidence on that bank. It also enhances brand reputation. If you are, you know, you are in a, you are keeping people's private data or personal data and you, you've not been um, um, uh, breached, then you, are, you, you enhance your reputation. Also, you, it maintains the, the quality, of, uh, quality and value of the data. It also safeguards the uh, data against uh, attacks and threats, and also meets the expectation of business partners, clients, and service providers. So those are some of the things that you can enjoy when you put in place a proper uh, privacy program in place within the, the enterprise. Now, we say that now we, uh, the, the uh, privacy program uh, management is an overarching uh, program. Now, for you to build that program, you, there's something, certain things that you need in place. And one of, one of the things that you need in place is what we call the privacy governance, which is um, uh, the component that guide a privacy function toward the compliance with privacy, uh, privacy laws and regulation and enable it to support the organization's um, broader business objectives and goals. Now, we, we saw that when we are developing this, when we are coming up with these privacy programs, there are certain things that we needed to, to put in place. And I think we looked at this uh, in, in our last uh, session. Uh, creating the organization privacy vision and mission uh, statement. Uh, what is this privacy program management going to do? Now, defining the scope of the privacy program, uh, selecting the appropriate, uh, appropriate privacy framework because uh, what we said here is that it is not uh, uh, you should not be able to uh, start something from the scratch you should not be able to reinvent the wheel there are certain frameworks that are in place that you can use and adopt to your organization also the development developing of organ uh, the organization privacy strategy we looked at that and then you need to also to structure that uh, privacy uh, team then we looked at uh, privacy compliance framework, uh, uh, which is a structured set of guidelines and practices that bring together uh, the regulatory compliance requirements that apply to an organization and business processes, policies, and uh, controls that are necessary to meet those requirements. We also talked about that 
uh, that privacy um, compliance uh, uh, framework will provide a structured way of managing uh, confidential data in such a way that the organization is able to comply with the complex laws in a multi-jurisdictional uh, multi uh, basis. So when we are looking at privacy compliance, we looked at something like uh, the governance, we looked at the, uh, we look at risk management, we look at compliance, we look at uh, privacy principles, which I think we looked at uh, last, last session, and um, uh, policies, procedures, controls, and, and records. So that, that is what we uh, did uh, uh, last, uh, in our last first session. So today we are continuing with the, with the privacy governance, and um, uh, let me just sh share my other um, uh, today's uh, uh, part two. So. Uh, today we are going to look at still uh, privacy governance, but we are going to look at the policies and data assessment. These are some things which are, things which are very important within the organization because there's no way you can uh, have your pro pro uh, program in place when you do not have policies, you do not have things like data assessment, and we are going to see what are these things all about. Now, if we talk about uh, privacy policy, what is a privacy policy? Now, privacy policy here is um, uh, uh, something or uh, an instrument that governs the privacy goals and strategic direction of the organization privacy office. We looked at how you can structure your privacy uh, office, and we saw that there's, there's always, there, there can be central, decentralized, and hybrid. Now, in, in any case, in whatever structure that you have in place, you'll find that the, the, the privacy office must be guided by some policy. So the policy that you put in place have, uh, uh, will give you the, will give the, the, the privacy office uh, how to, the strategic direction of that particular office. Now, the privacy policy is something which is a high, a high level governance that aligns the privacy vision and mission uh, statement with the, of that organization. You remember, before you put uh, the, your privacy program management in place, then you need to put in place a, uh, the vision and mission of the statement. So your, your privacy policy must, may, uh, must be able to align with the uh, privacy vision and mission of the organization. Now, the privacy policy should be able to, uh, should be appropriate to the purpose of the organization. What is the organization doing? Or, or, or what is the, uh, the, 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 which industry is the organization? What is the organization doing? Now, that is defined on uh, in, in, in the vision and mission statement of the organization, which also must also be, uh, 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 the privacy mission and uh, uh, mission and vision must also be aligned to the uh, vision and mission of the organization. So privacy policy should be able to should be appropriate to the purpose of the organization. The privacy policy should uh, provide the framework for setting up uh, setting the objectives. The privacy um, policy should be able to include commitment to satisfy applicable privacy safeguarding requirements and the privacy uh, policy should also be able to include commitment or, or to continue uh, improvement and be communicated within the organization because you cannot have a, a privacy policy and it is not communicated everybody who is within the organization who is affected by the program uh, privacy program must be able to understand read and know uh, what uh, policies are there. Now, also the privacy policy must be available to the interested parties as, as appropriate. If you have uh, your uh, suppliers, you have your, your other partners, then they need to also understand what your uh, privacy policies is, if it is necessary that they need to understand so. So 
Policies should be clear and easy to understand, accessible to only oil employees, uh, comprehensive and concise, uh, action oriented and measurable and testable. Which means that policy is not just a paper that you put there. This policy, first of all, it should be uh, employees should understand them, and it in which means that it is uh, accessible to all employees. They've read it; they can they can be able to understand. Now it has to be comprehensive, but uh, yet very concise, and it has to be uh, action oriented. Which means that can can that policy uh, lead to implementation of something? That must be uh, that is what the policy is supposed to be. Is it action oriented? Which means that if I want to implement this policy, how do I implement this policy? Maybe what kind uh, you uh, always use procedures to implement. So is this policy uh, in place action oriented and is it measurable or testable? So these are some of the things that you have to understand when you are crafting the uh, privacy policy for the organization. Now the policy supports a, vari a variety of uh, documents communicated internally and externally that explain uh, to customer how organization handles their personal information. Remember, this is uh, 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 customers or clients have given you uh, their inf uh, information. They need to understand how you actually handle their personal information. Now, that uh, that, that uh, should ca come out very much uh, very, very well in the policy. That that kind of, kind of document. Then it should also explain to employee how the organization handles personal information. Now, uh, this document should also describe the steps for employees to uh, handling personal uh, in, in information and to be able to outline how personal data will be processed. So these are things that must come out and must be very well articulated in the policies that you put for, for, the, uh, for the enterprise. What are some of the components of, the, of a policy? Uh, one, um, a policy must have a purpose. Now, what is the purpose of the policy? Now, the purpose of the policy explains the policy, why the policy exists, as well as the goals of the po uh, privacy policy and the program used to meet the, prim uh, the primary standard uh, based, uh, based on national, regional, and uh, local laws. Which means that when you are doing the uh, when you are crafting your policies, you have to take into play into consideration the, the national, regional, and local laws because depending on the industry which you, you are, uh, you'll be affected by different uh, legislations or you'll be affected by different re regulations and and uh, and national or regional laws. So you need to you, you, the purpose of the policy must come out very clear in that. Now, also policy must have a scope. A scope is what defines which resources, such as the facilities, such as the hardware, such as the software, information, personnel, uh, the policy protects. So the scope of the policy must be, uh, a policy must have a scope. A policy must also have what we call the risk and responsibilities, uh, which assigns the pri uh, privacy responsibility roles throughout the organization overseen by a privacy uh, program office who is supposed to do what uh, within the organization within this uh, within the, 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 this the, 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 this organization so those responsibilities must be uh, properly uh, assigned now the the responsibilities of leaders uh, managers employees contractors and all other all other users uh, of data must be delineated which means that every policy must be properly articulated uh, uh, within that policy. The other, uh, the other aspect is also this component of this component of risk and responsibility uh, serves as the basis for establishing employee and data accountability. Because without responsibility, then people will not be accountable for what they they're doing. So that responsibility should be should be part and parcel of of uh, 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 of of the of a poli of the policy. Now the other uh, the other um, uh, aspect of the policy is compliance. Now compliance, when you talk about uh, uh, the component of compliance, we are talking about the main topic in the in 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 privacy policy, and sometimes it is found 
in the relevant standards such as the applicable data law, the data protection law, or, or some things like that. So compliance, compliance is very important a, a component of, of the policy. So compliance factors include things like the general organization compliance to ensure that the privacy policy assigns the roles and responsibility at the proper level or in the organization to create an oversight group. Also, the, this, uh, the compliance factor, you need to consider the ability uh, to apply penalty and disciplinary action, uh, action with authorization for the creation of compliance structures that may include this disciplinary action for uh, specific violations because you, uh, you uh, without that then uh, people might be able to uh, violate the, the the policy and will there's nothing that you can be able to to do so you have to have uh, that the, uh, the, the, you have to have in place those penalties and disciplinary actions for whatever was uh, violated the the, the the policy what is supposed to be done now, also, uh, compliance factors should include understanding the penalties for non-compliance uh, with the laws and regulations. Now, when you talk about policy, there are two, two types within of the policies within the organization. Now, there's what we call the privacy notice versus uh, and privacy policy. When you talk about a privacy policy, we are talking about an internal document which is addressed to the employees and data users, uh, uh, which clearly states how personal information will be uh, handed, uh, stored, and transmitted uh, to meet the organizational needs, as well as laws and regulations. Now, it also talks about, it also defines all aspects of uh, data privacy for the organization, including how privacy notice is formed and uh, um uh, how it will uh, what it contains now the other aspect of uh, uh, privacy is what we normally call the privacy notice and uh, uh, privacy notice is more of external communication to the individual to the customers to the data subject that describes how organization collects uses shares um, retains and discloses its personal information based on the organization privacy policy. Now, this is what when you go to, to our website, you'll be able to see uh, their uh, privacy notice. So this is a, a policy, is a, a privacy policy, but it's geared towards the external uh, communication uh, for people who are, uh, you are working with you, people who are uh, 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 coming to your website, people who are working for the for the organization, things like that. So that is what we, those, those are the two kinds of policies when we talk about a privacy policy. We have the internal privacy policy and we have the privacy you know, uh, the privacy notice which is always external and uh, in most cases you find in the in each and every website now there's also the the aspect of communication now we uh, when i was introducing policy i said co policy must be communicated to each and every uh, member of the organization or who needs to access uh, 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 access those policies so you'll find that in many organizations, they'll create a privacy uh, committee or a council uh, composed of representatives of function who may launch the privacy program and manage it throughout the, the, the policy life cycle. Now, this does not really uh, apply to each and organization. It depends on the setup of, of, of organization. But you'll find that the, the, the appropriate way is always to have this committee which is a representative from all functions and, and who are be, will be able to manage the, pro, uh, the privacy program and manage uh, it throughout uh, the, 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 the life cycle. Now the committee makes strategic decisions uh, that affect the vision, uh, change the key concepts or determine when alterations need, are needed. Also we find that organization with global footprints uh, if your organization is, is a multinational organization ex existing in various countries, then uh, you, you find that they often create a governance structure composed of representatives from each business function or geographical regions uh, in which the organization has a presence. So this also depends also on the structure of that organization. They can, they, 
they might, might decide that each and every region will have a representative because that region has got their own local uh, legislation uh, about privacy. So you will look at it from the international level, but also each and every region must be governed according to the, the national uh, legislation and regulations that are present in that area. For example, you might be an organization, uh, an international organization, and what you'll need to do is you'll have to follow, let's say, the GDPR. Now, if you are follow, uh, GDPR is your main policy, uh, main, main data protection, but you find that if you are in Kenya, then the Kenyan affiliate will be able to follow the GDPR as well as the follow, follow the Data Protection Act 2019. So that is all how uh, what we mean by having to create a governance structure. Now, the, go the, the governance structure uh, provides a communication chain to be used in performing uh, key data protection uh, uh, activities. So this is very important, communicating that policy to each and every member of the organization. They need to know what the policy talks about and you have to have a, a structure of communicating that policy to each and every member of the organization. Now, when you are cre creating policy, there are also some cost consideration that you have to take into uh, in place. Now, you find that several uh, potential costs are associated with the developing, implementing, and uh, maintaining policies. Policies are not, some, are not some, something that comes cheaply. You need to uh, uh, expend uh, some time in developing that uh, policy. Uh, you need to spend some time in implementing that policy and maintaining the policy. So the most si significant um, uh, are related to implementing the policy and addressing the impact of the, uh, on the organization that potentially limit, reduce, uh, remo uh, remove, or change the way data is protected. Once you've developed that policy, uh, and you implement the policy. Now, if you once you implement that policy, you need to also monitor that policy. So you find that uh, you'll you spend a lot of um, time and, and resources to make sure that the policy that you've developed, uh, uh, is it working according to what you intended it to, to be? Or is it potentially limiting or reducing or removing or changing the way data is protected? Remember, what is our what is the main thing here uh, is the data and uh, in in this data centric uh, uh, economy uh, we find that data is the, the, the currency data is the oil data is everything so is that data being protected appropriately within the organization and that is why you are coming up with the policies to to make sure that this happens now other costs that are uh, are incurred through the policy development and management uh, include things like the administrative costs and management uh, functions required to draft, develop, finalize, and update the policy. Yeah, this you find that this is uh, important because you'll find that you may not have the resources internally to develop policy. You know, may not have those uh, resources to make sure that the policy is according to to what uh, to 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 the regulations that are available within that uh, within the, the that jurisdiction so uh, you need to uh, employ somebody you need to contract somebody to ensure that you are you can be able to develop uh, those um, uh, th those policies so administrative and management management functions who will will take uh, a part of the cost when when you are talking about policy cost consideration also, a cost associated with dissemination and communication policy, communicating policy through training and awareness activities. Um, uh, within the organization, if you have the, your, your uh, privacy program uh, in place, then you need to also make sure that people are trained uh, and people are made aware of the, 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 the program itself. And this includes policies that, that you put in place. People must be able to, to know that, uh, to know and understand what these policies stand for. And without this, then you'll find that you have very good policies, but they, they're just uh, catching dust on, 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 the, on shelves because 
people are not aware of them. So training and awareness is, is very important when, when you, are talk, where you want to implement the policies. So what does implementing policies in, uh, entail? Now, uh, privacy-related policy will not be effective if individuals do not care about or follow them. I've just talked about that. Now, organizations should seek to, uh, ways to enable employees to integrate the policies into their daily tasks which means that this policy should be part and parcel of your daily or employees daily, daily tax so that they will be able to observe those policies so okay, you must make sure that you have the tools or the processes uh, in place to make sure that these employees will be able to integrate these policies in their daily tasks now um, this can be achieved by aligning policy with the existing business procedures training of employees and uh, raising awareness we've talked about that also, you find that in multinational organizations, um, they have additional challenges to ensure that policies and, uh, are consistent and uniform across all locations while satisfying local laws, regulations, and industry guidelines. That is, uh, that is exactly what I was trying to explain, because you might be an organization which is internationally a multinational organization, but you'll find that, yes, we, are, we have GDPR, which is our main data protection law that we need to implement and, and, and maintain. However, each and every country nowadays, you find that they've, they've come up with their own regulations, own data protection law. So as much as you are maintaining, this, maintaining the police, uh, the, 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 the privacy uh, uh, and, and maintaining this, the, these policies, you have to make sure that those policies are inconsistent and are uniform or uh, across all locations and are taking into consideration the, the, the laws, the regulations and industry guidance, uh, depending on the, which industry you are operating on, uh, in. Now, raising awareness and properly training employees and uh, data users is also very key to knowledge transfer and re re retention. I think I've, I've talked about that enough. Now, there's also, uh, we could talk about a lot about this, the, the, uh, the, the issue of policies, if time could allow, but um, because of time, we cannot be able to uh, speak and e talk, each, uh, talk on each and every aspect of policy. However, there's an important policy that is always important within the organization, which is called the data retention and destruction policies. Now, you remember when we were looking at the privacy principles, we talked about you collect data that you need to collect, only data that you need to collect, you, uh, you collect that, and then you only keep that data until the, the, for the period in which you need to use it. After that, you should be able to destroy that data. And you, uh, when you tell, say destroy, we are saying secure destruction of that data. So in, in that aspect, you also need to have in place data retention and destruction policy. If you are going to retain this data, maybe you, are, you don't want to de destroy it, then there must be a policy in place that uh, you, you follow to retain this data. So personal information should be retained only as long as necessary to perform the stated purpose. Now, data destruction triggers, uh, and, um, uh, triggers and methods should be documented and followed consistently by all employee, uh, employees, which means that if that data has been used and it needs to be destroy, destroyed, there must be a ways to destroy that data. And uh, uh, there, there should be methods of destroying that data. So actions an, uh, an organization can take to develop a data retention policy include, you need to determine what data is currently being retained, how and where. Uh, you also need to look at work uh, you do also need to, to to work with legal to determine the applicable legal and data retention requirements depending on uh, the, the, the sensitivity of that data now you also need to brainstorm the scenarios that could re uh, require data retention maybe you've collected this data and you need to to retain it uh, uh, but you collected it to do a certain activity and that activity is over and you're saying that we need to retain that data. So how do you need uh, do, do, or how, under what uh, uh, criteria do you need to retain that data? You also need to 
estimate the business impact of retaining versus destroying the data. Now, if should we retain the data, should we destroy it? You have to, what is the business impact? If we destroy the data or when we retain the data. So also, because sometimes you find that you retain the data against the data subject uh, 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 consent, then you you'll be you can be a, 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 you can be liable to certain pen penalties. So you have to estimate the impact of retaining versus destroying the data. Also, you work to you must work with IT to develop and uh, implement a policy because sorry because policy you find that. When you're implementing the policy, you you, you need uh, a technical system. So you need to work with the, the IT department to ensure that you can be able to implement those policies. How are those policies going to be, be disseminated to the employees? Maybe through the internet. And that is why <clears throat> you need IT to help you in that. Now, that brings us to the end of policies. Um, and then from there, let's look at... Uh, uh, apart from the policy, what else uh, is important? What is important also is what we call data assessment, or sometimes we uh, you you'll find uh, they call it data mapping uh, or inventory data inventory. So data assessment. Now data assessment um, uh, is a very important uh, uh, aspect within private privacy program uh, management because as uh, you will only have a, a successful privacy program. Uh, if you have a, a comprehensive view of the data the organization uh, store and process remember when we were talking about uh, the scoping scoping of your your privacy program we talked about you need to understand which data, what kind of data the organization process uh, uh, collects and uh, processes and stores so uh, the, uh, uh, that aspect is what we call the data assessment you need to make assessment of the data that you, you, the organization stores and process. So data assessment will help you to inventory and track personal information, as well as determine the impact of the, the, the organization system and process will have on privacy. So without this data assessment, then how do you know which, what data uh, you are storing, which data you are processing? So that data assessment is very important. So data assessment are, are tools that can help identify privacy risks to individual in advance and deal with them effectively at the beginning of any project that involves processing of personal data. You here is a case that you want to collect, uh, say, 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 say for instance, Oduma was collecting data uh, or, uh, for uh, personal data of, of um, citizens. So data assessment, uh, even if within a, an organization, when you are collecting data uh, from people, then you need to know that the, uh, uh, that assessment will help you know which data you are processing. But apart from that, it will help you to identify what risks are there and how to deal with this risk when you are starting any new pro uh, project that will involve processing of uh, personal data. So addressing potential problem early will help you to achieve more robust compliance regime and ultimately reduce cost. Remember, it is very expensive when you are you are uh, you, 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 penalty is imposed on you. you are, when you are imposed with penalty, it will be very expensive. So it is important that when you are collecting personal data belonging to, to individuals, then what you need to do, do data assessment, because this is going to help you in a lot of things, to uh, prevent a lot of things. It is going to help you in uh, to identify privacy risk. It's also going to help you to identify those early problems before you start processing the data. So when we're talking about data assessment, we're talking about inventory and records. These are uh, uh, what we call the, the data inventory or data maps, map. Or data map or data inventory is just identifies the uh, the, the data as it moves from uh, uh, from uh, one system to the to the other, indicating how it is shared and organized and where it is located. So that is what we call the data inventory. 
how is uh, it identifies the data where is which system has the data how is that data moving within the system and where is that data stored how is that data shared with the within the organization or outside so the data is categorized um, by subject matter to identify the inconsistent data versions um, uh, identify and mitigate data disparities uh, identify the most and least valuable data and reveal how it is accessed and used so it is important to do this inventory uh, very much early before you start any pro project that is uh, going to collect uh, data, uh, uh, personal data. So uh, creating and maintaining data inventory may be the responsibility of a privacy function, or it could be a, a function of IT, or it could be a function of both. Because here, remember what we are using, we are using tools, and we are using technical tools to collect this data. So it depends on, 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 the rest, on the structure of the organization. But you'll find that in most cases, the privacy function will work in hand in hand with the IT function to make sure that because uh, uh, all, the, the, all this data is stored in, in, in IT systems. Uh, so they work, need to work together to, to, to uh, do this uh, inventory. Most often, you find that the budget for this undertaking is shared by both departments. So inventory is very important. Inventorying your records uh, uh, before you do anything is very important. So once the data inventory has been completed and documented, the, uh, the information can be used uh, when necessary to address both incident and standard risk assessment. So uh, uh, this means that the data has already been, uh, been, 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 been uh, uh, stored, collected and stored and documented so you can use that uh, uh, as you in your privacy uh, um, uh, activities so data inventory process uh, helps the organization uh, uh, priorities for privacy initiatives by uh, providing data locations where is the data stored the data use how that that data is being used the data storage how where is that data stored uh, and data access which means that allowing people to access that data in what how do they access that data so that which means that uh, by doing that it, it will allow it allow the privacy team to set priorities and understand the data usage within the organization which means that the all in all there's no way you can start um and and, and go on and put in place privacy uh, program management without uh, having to know exactly which data you, you have and where are those data stored or how, what is that, the usage of those data. This all comes with the, with the data assessment and uh, data inventory. Now, organization may, may, may want to establish an uh, inventory of applicable laws and regulation, yes, because you might, you might find that you are an organization and you are subjected to various uh, more applicable laws and regulation. For example, if you are operating in Kenya, you are an international organization, you have to uh, observe the GDPR, you have to observe maybe the, the, the uh, uh, Kenya's uh, Data Protection Act 2019. Maybe if you are in financial sector, then you, there are certain regulation, applicable regulation that you need to, 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 to adhere to. So it is important that you need to have the inventory of these applicable laws and regulations that the, the organization must be able to adhere to. Consider international, uh, local, and industry specific laws, uh, standards and laws, uh, and uh, then map uh, against them. So we've just, that's what, just what I've talked about. Uh, um, uh, you look at the international uh, law, let's say GDPR, look at the international, the local law, which is uh, maybe the data protection act you look at the the industry specific uh, laws maybe if you're in the banking sector you are looking at something like um, uh, PS, uh, P pci uh, psd uh, 2 uh, something like that psi uh, standard uh, so pci standard so you need to uh, consider those are what we call the industry specific standards and laws don't you need to map them uh, against those particular laws. 
privacy assessment. So within the organization, there's what we call privacy assessment, which is just a measure or, or a measure uh, which measures the organization's compliance to uh, laws, regulation, adoptive standards, and internal uh, policies and procedures. So where in any organization you can do a privacy assessment just to 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 gauge how you the the, the, the necessary or the applicable uh, laws regulation uh, or adopted standard policies are complied with. So that is what we call the privacy assessment. So scope includes education and awareness, monitoring and scope uh, responding to regulatory environment, data uh, systems and uh, process uh, process assessment, things like uh, uh, risk assessment, incident response, uh, contracts, remediation. You, there's a lot of things that within the privacy uh, program management that you have to look at. So when you are doing your privacy assessment, these are some of the things that you need to look at. How are we? How are our uh, is our risk assessment structured? How is our incident response uh, 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 structured? How do we? What do we do when we are we are getting into contract? What are some of the the, the program assurance and things like the audit audit things like that? So a, a privacy assessment are always conducted internally. This is like internal audit by the audit function or by a DP or uh, what we call the data protection officer within the organization if one has been recruited, uh, or it can be done by a business function or externally by a third party. But in most cases, you find that privacy assessment within the organization is just done by an internal personnel uh, who, because they just want to see how they are complying with the, this, uh, the, the, the applicable laws, how they are complying with the, with the adopted standards, how they are complying with the internal and uh, policies and procedures. So the, uh, it happens on, on a predetermined uh, period and can be conducted in response to security or a uh, privacy breach or at the request of enforcement authority. But remember privacy uh, assessment is more of an internal uh, uh, activity rather than external activity. So it might, if they, 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 they internally they feel that there, there was a breach, then they can uh, start, uh, they, they invoke this privacy assessment or if it is required by, by a, a department uh, within the organization. Then what we have what we call privacy impact assessment. When the organization wants to, to uh, is getting into a project, then you need to do what we call the privacy in, uh, impact assessment. And you find now this privacy uh, impact assessment is uh, enshrined in many data protection laws. If you look at uh, the, the GDPR, you'll find that they, 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 they talk about the privacy impact assessment. If you talk the data protection, uh, 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 2019, you also talk about privacy impact assessment. Sometimes it, it, they swap uh, this, um, uh, the, the terms and call it data protection impact assessment. But uh, uh, also, uh, uh, there's a little, little different, even though they, they, they can be used as, as one term, but there's a little different. Now, Privacy impact assessment is an analysis of privacy uh, risks associated with processing personal information in a, in a rela uh, relation to a project, uh, service, or a product, which means that if your organization is developing a product or a project which is going to involve collection of in personal information, then you need to do that uh, privacy impact assessment. So privacy impact assessment also should suggest or provide remedial actions or mitigations necessary to avoid or reduce the risk. The, the important thing here is that this private, the, the privacy assessment, uh, impact assessment just helps you to reduce the risk. It's just, it's just sort of a risk assessment uh, within the privacy uh, uh, sphere. So requirements regarding privacy impact assessment uh, emanate from industry codes. Uh, it can also be, be due to a uh, uh, organizational uh, policy. Uh, it can also be a, a, a due to uh, applicable uh, laws and regulations or supervisory authority, whereby the, the, uh, the, the regulator needs that uh, has uh, stipulated you, um, uh, areas 
or why they should be able to do that privacy impact assessment. So privacy impact assessment can help facilitate privacy by design, which is the concept of building privacy directly into technology uh, systems and practices at the design age uh, phase, which means if you are developing a product, now you must make sure that that product that you are developing has in place in 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 place privacy uh, privacy as is taken into consideration from the design phase that is what we call the the privacy by design so privacy impact assessment will help us uh, to to uh, to facilitate uh, the um, uh, privacy by design making sure that privacy is part and parcel of that product that you are uh, building and it is not an afterthought so that is what we call privacy design by design, uh, 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 making sure that pri uh, building privacy directly into the technology systems and uh, practices at the design age phase, I mean. It helps um, ensure privacy is considered from the outset and is not an afterthought. Now, privacy impact assessment also uh, is a very effective tool. And for it to be an effective tool, uh, it should be uh, uh, accomplished early in the uh, in in the in the uh, in 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 the early phase, which means that prior to deployment of a project or a product or a service uh, that involves the collection of personal information. If any project that you are going to do, you know that is going to involve collection of personal information, then privacy impact assessment needs to be done. So it should also uh, be done early when there, there are new or, uh, or revised industry standards, organization policies, and uh, uh, laws and regulations, depending on the industry that you are, you, you, you are operating in. Also, it should be done early when the organization creates a new privacy uh, risk, risk through changes to methods by which personal information is handled. So events that may trigger uh, the need for uh, privacy impact assessment is actually something like conversion of records from paper-based to electronic format. Here is a case that everything that you've been uh, uh, storing the, or involving personal data is in a paper format. Now you want to uh, uh, do it, uh, 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 digitize it. So you need to do um, uh, conduct privacy impact assessment. So it also looks uh, sometimes when you are retiring, uh, retiring of systems that held or process personal information, then you need to do a privacy impact assessment to see that what are the effects of, of, of retiring these systems. Also, it can be done when, when significant matching, matching and man manipulation of multiple databases containing personal information. If you are merging two databases together, then you also need to conduct privacy impact assessment. Also, when uh, there's alteration of a business process resulting in significant new collection, uh, use and disclosure of personal information, then also need to do privacy impact assessment. So privacy impact assessment is a risk management tool, just as I said from the, 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 the onset. It's a risk management tool used to identify and reduce the privacy and data uh, protection um, risks to individuals or organization and is aimed at ensuring a more holistic risk management strategy. So when we talk about uh, privacy impact assessment, we're just talking about risk um, management in uh, privacy uh, setup. Then some, uh, we also have what we call data protection impact assessment. Now, uh, this privacy impact assessment, sometimes you call it data protection impact assessment, except that when you talk about data protection uh, uh, impact assessment, you find that data protection impact assessment is always enshrined in many data protection uh, uh, legislation, like uh, it is specifically uh, on uh, GDPR, in, in uh, uh, Data Protection Act 2019, you also find there's um, a specific clause on data protection uh, assessment. 
And the other thing is also normally when we talk about privacy, uh, it, privacy and data protection are more, are more or less uh, synonymous, except that sometimes you find that mostly you use privacy, uh, US uses uh, privacy most than when you talk about it in the EU uh, uh, region. In the EU region, we talk about most about the data protection, but you'll find that uh, sometimes you can talk about data protection impact assessment and privacy impact assessment synonymously. Now, data protection impact assessment is, is the same thing. When the organization collects, stores, and uses personal data, the individual whose data is being uh, processed are always exposed to risks because you don't know what would what happen to your data. So personal data can be, 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 be stolen or can be released inadvertently and can be used by uh, criminals to impersonate individuals. This is what we call the identity theft. And it is very important, very common nowadays, whereby you, somebody uses your data to do uh, some criminal activities. So data, data protection impact assessment is designed to identify risks arising out of processing personal data and, to, and to minimize this risk as much as early as possible. Also, uh, under the GDPR, the non-compliance of or with the DPIA uh, uh, requirements can lead to fines imposed by the competent supervisory authority. And this is why I, I say that the, 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 the slight difference is that when we talk about DPIA, it is, it is enshrined in most legislation and failure to do it, you can see that the, the fines that you that are imposed on it. So data protection impact assessment are required only when organization is subject to GDPR and has specific triggers. So uh, that is the difference. So you can see that uh, when you talk about uh, privacy impact as is something that you can do willingly, uh, but uh, uh, is it, not necessarily uh, necessarily uh, enshrined in in a law. But when you talk about data protection impact assessment, it is something that is enshrined in law. And specifically, like you can see that last point that it is required only when organization is subscribing to GDPR because GDPR specifically has got the clues for data impact, data protection impact assessment, as well as the Kenyan Data Protection Act. So when is the uh, data protection impact assessment required? So in case the, the, the processing is likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedom of natural persons, then the controller shall uh, prior to processing, carry out the DPIA. So which that is, and this is specifically uh, strictly from the GDPR, uh, this clause, that if there's likely that there's a high risk to the rights and freedom of natural persons, then you need to do the DD, uh, DPIA. So DPIA is the process by which companies can systematically assess and identify the privacy and data protection impact of any product they offer uh, or, or any services they, uh, they, they provide. So it, it, whatever product that you are offering, whatever service that you are uh, uh, providing, if it is likely to result in a high risk to, uh, to, to, the, to the rights and, and freedoms of natural person, then you need to do the data protection impact assessment. It enables them to identify the impact and take the appropriate action to prevent or at the very least minimize the risk of those impacts. Also, many companies today already embed and carry out the uh, data protection impact assessment as part of their existing project management and risk management methodologies and, and policies. So you'll find that because you subscribe to this, uh, this uh, kind of regulation, be it the uh, uh, GDPR, be it uh, any other uh, law that which has got the data protection uh, impact assessment enshrined in it, then you need to uh, uh, do it. Mm -hmm.
So what, what kind of variations require this, uh, this uh, data protection impact assessment? Uh, this is uh, according to the GDPR. Now, systematic ex and extensive profiling uh, that produces legal effect or significantly affect individual. If you are, you are, uh, you, you are collecting data that is profiling somebody, uh, that is profiling uh, individuals and uh, which has got legal effects, uh, which can affect that particular individual, then you need to do, uh, the, you require the, uh, the, the DPIA. Processing activities that use special categories of personal data on large scale, uh, that's also a, a requirement. Also the systematic monitoring of publicly accessible area on a large scale, so, so, uh, something like the, the CCTV, uh, you, you are using CCTV to, to monitor a, a place, uh, a, a large uh, publicly accessible area, or in or other video surveillance in public areas and potentially the use of drones. Uh, and I think th th this is this is something that uh, most most countries do not uh, have never never looked into. Or when we are you are, we are, we are uh, you are putting the CCTV in public places. You are using drone. Uh, um, it's not something that has been uh, taken into consideration. So processing data concerning vulnerable data subjects because the the, the increased power in or imbalance between the data subject and data controller. If you go to people who are mentally retarded, then you want to uh, collect inform, uh, information from them. You see, the, 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 there's imbalance between the data subject, the person who is, who is giving the information, and the person who is collecting that information. So that also requires DPIA. Now, the individual may also may be unable to easily consent or oppose uh, the processing of their data or exercise their rights. So, it's, for example, the employees here, you know, as employees, if the employer says that, yeah, we are we are doing this with your. We want to collect this with your. We want we want to do this with your personal data. You do not have uh, the 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 the, the uh, maybe you, without your consent. See, you are you are unable to easily give consent, or you are you are not able to oppose because maybe that whatever the, the player wants to do maybe it could be of benefit to you, or maybe it is not benefit, benefiting to you, but is benefiting the organization. So if in such case, also we need a data protection impact assessment. Also there's important, uh, something important when we are, we are talking about uh, as, uh, uh, privacy management, because you see, when you talk about privacy, you, you are not only talking about uh, employees and, and the organization uh, uh, alone. You are also talking about vendors, people who are uh, working, uh, for supplying the, the organization, uh, people who are contractors to the organization. So you also need to, to, to assess them to ensure that when you are, uh, the, 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 do they have in place proper uh, privacy program in place uh, that, uh, to, to ensure that uh, in the chain, uh, there's there's no there, there's no breakage or there's no no weak chain weak link uh, within the chain. So it is always important to do assessment for the vendors that you work with. So uh, it is standards for selecting uh, standards for selecting vendors. Maybe first of all, you look at the reputation of the vendor before you work with somebody. You have to look at the reputation, uh, the, the, which means that you have to request. Uh, 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 or, or contact references to help determine uh, vendors' reputation with other companies in, per, um, in the appropriate collection and use of personal data. If this vendor is coming and you want to onboard the vendor, then what are their strategy? What do they have even policy? Do they have even a program to uh, 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 when it comes to collection and use of personal data? Because if you don't, you have uh, especially lawyers, I think I think this refer, uh, refers very much to the to lawyers. If you are a lawyer for KCB, you know you'll be handling a lot of information about KCB. Now, if it, you yourself as a law firm does not have a, 
appropriate uh, uh, measures in place to protect this data, which means that uh, maybe that this data is kept in your, your computer systems or it is, it is uh, 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 there are uh, physical files that uh, you come with them to your office. How do you protect that data? So it is important that an organization for, uh, assess the vendor to, uh, to understand if they have in place appropriate collection and use of personal data. Also, uh, do, this, the, the, do these vendors have uh, information security pro control? Do they have uh, a proper way of protecting that, this, this data? That's, that is, a service provider should have sufficient uh, security control in place to ensure that data is not lost or uh, is not stolen. Now, it, it, it is always important because uh, uh, vendors are actually where uh, a point of weakness within the organization. So the point of transfer between the, the, the procuring, procuring, uh, procuring organization and the vendor is always uh, very vulnerable. So vendors, uh, that is what we call the point of transfer, where you are collecting the, that, that information, uh, it becomes so vulnerable. So evaluating vendors should involve all relevant internal and external uh, stakeholders, including internal audit, uh, information security, uh, physical security. These guys should be involved in making sure that they, they can uh, they, they evaluate the, the vendors that you want to work with so that you know that in your pro privacy program uh, chain, there's no weak link, uh, weak, uh, there's no weakest link. We are still when we're talking about uh, uh, vendors, we are talking about the third party, uh, third party. So this, uh, what you need to do is th that you have to do that risk management. Whatever your, your evaluation is all about risk management. That is the third part risk management. So it, this risk management refers to the activities to discover and manage risk associated with external organization performing and operational uh, function of for for an organization. If for example, this you are uh, you have internet provider and you do not have uh, on-prem uh, application. Everything is is stored on uh, in on the cloud. So these are what we call uh, third party. So there's there's need for that uh, that uh, that uh, risk management to 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 be conducted. So many organizations outsource some of their information uh, processing. To third parties, uh, uh, in form of maybe cloud-based software as a service, uh, platform as a service, for so economic reasons. Now there are so many reasons why uh, many organizations have done this because it is cheaper. Uh, you don't is is there's no it's not capital intensive, uh, but is you 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 don't treat it as capex. You only treat it as opex. So it it, it becomes cheaper if you're dealing with the, something like software as a service or platform as a service. So there are so many reasons why organizations do that. So it is less expensive to pay for a software or leasing arrangement than to develop, implement, integrate, and maintain the software internet. But what is important is that the risk management must, uh, must uh, be conducted. The same risks present in third party services are present within the organization processing environment which means that now there's no way whatever you're doing you are not going to pass the responsibility to the third party but because the responsibility for securing this data remains with you so as much as you are, have uh, 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 outsourced this this activity to a third party uh, it is important that to make sure that uh, that that third party is uh, that data is securely uh, is secured properly so the discipline of third party uh, uh, risk exists because of the complexity associated with the identifying risk in third party organization because sometimes they will not give you the the, the true uh, facts of, of, of the matter and sometimes you find that the third party uh, risk assessment is similar to other risk assessment risk management the difference lies in acquiring relevant information to identify risk outside the organization direct control because this is a third party if you are doing a, a risk management then you will run into problems but what is important that that risk uh, uh, management is is properly uh, conducted 
uh, organization lacking a mature uh, third party risk management program should implement a process that asserts both security and privacy requirements to relevant service providers. We also have cloud service providers. Here we are organization moving to the uh, cloud-based environment. Uh, often assume that their uh, cloud service providers have taken all the necessary security and privacy. This is what I said is wrong. You cannot be able to, you cannot pass the responsibility to the cloud provider. You still have the responsibility to secure this data uh, and you, the, you report directly to the, the, the you are a customer. So you don't, you will not be able to tell your customer that, no, you see, we have a third party or we have a cloud service provider who is doing this for us. So we, they have to share the blame. No. So you must make sure that you, that data is properly uh, secured. So this often result in the security and privacy breaches because each party believes that uh, the other party is performing uh, critical data protection tasks. Now that is the problem. Now, the function of data handling aspect of privacy are only responsibility of the organization using the third party services, not the third party itself. I think I've, I've done, I've talked about that uh, several times. Now, laws and regulation in many industry uh, that now require uh, organization to build and operate effective third party programs within the organization. You must have a, a program on how you are going to handle third party Within the, organization, within the organization. If you don't have that and something happens, remember you are not going to, to shift the blame to the uh, uh, third party or pro, uh, cloud providers. Now we talked, we mentioned something about the privacy by design. And we say that it is a concept developed, um, uh, uh, is a, it is a concept which was developed in the 1990s by somebody called Anne. Kavukian, who is the former Information and Privacy Commissioner of, of, of the province of Ontario in Canada. Now, the concept uh, dictates that, the, that designing for privacy must beginning, uh, begin during the development phase of a system and continue into the life cycle of the data. So the core goal of privacy by design is to embed pri uh, privacy within a technological system as an integral part of the design and do so ex ante and throughout the technological life cycle, rather than trying to fix it ex post when it, uh, it's often too late and expensive. So which means that if you are developing a software, if you are developing a product, you must make sure that the privacy is designed from the beginning, from the development phase of that particular product you must take into consideration. Otherwise, if you leave it to fix it later, then you'll find that it is too late and it is too expensive. Now, this, this uh, privacy uh, by design has gained uh, traction uh, within many organizations, including the US Federal Trade Commission and the, in, in also in the European Commission. Uh, this uh, privacy by design has gained a lot of uh, traction. So what are some of the principles of privacy by design? First of all, it's a, uh, the first one is proactive, not reactive, preventive, not remedial, which means that privacy by design anticipates and uh, prevents privacy, in, uh, uh, privacy invasive events before they happen, rather than waiting for privacy risk to materialize. So that is the first principle of uh, privacy defined by design. The second principle is privacy as a default, which means that when you buy that product, when you buy that service, no action is required by the individual to maintain their privacy. It is built into the system by the default. Now, the other aspect is the privacy embedded into the, 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 the design, which means that privacy is an essential component of the core functionality being designed and delivered. And then the, the other the other component the principle is it is full 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 functionality positive sum and not zero sum which means that privacy by design design seeks to accommodate all legitimate interest and objective rather than making unnecessary trade-offs. 
The other uh, principle is end-to-end -end security, which is uh, the li full life cycle pro protection, which means that it, uh, strong security measures are uh, essential to pri privacy uh, from start to finish in the life cycle of the data. And remember when we were talking about privacy, we say that privacy, the two components, the, the data, the data um, governance and uh, cyber security, which means that uh, that's the aspect of, secu uh, of securing that data is lies with the, with the, the cyber security aspect. The other principle is visibility and transparency, which means that the component parts and operations remain via, uh, visible and transparent to users and provide uh, providers alike. There's nothing which is, which is hidden. There's nothing which is in, the, in smoke. Uh, visibility and transparency, transparency are essential uh, to establishing accountability and trust. Remember when we were talking about, even when you are called uh, principles of, of, um, uh, of privacy, we talked about uh, visibility, we talked about transparency, um, uh, and things like that. So we, 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 privacy by design, one of the principles of privacy of the design is that visibility and transparency within that particular product. The last one is the respect for user privacy, which means that re, uh, respect, respect users' privacy and keep the interest of individual in focus when designing a new system uh, architecture. Uh, that is strong privacy defaults, and empowering user-friendly uh, options. So those are the seven principles of privacy by design, uh, the, uh, and, and it is something that has taken traction in many organizations. So principles ensure that an organization um, establishes a, a culture of privacy as realized through privacy framework, mission statement, and uh, training and awareness. There's no, not, no way you can be able to to undertake this uh, uh, without uh, uh, training and awareness. So when we look at the GDPR, the, we also talk about what we call this privacy by default. Now, it is, uh, it, it is, this is introduced in a specific clause in the, in, in the, the GDPR, which uh, as, as you are not looking at the GDPR itself, uh, I, 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 I have not put the, the clause there. But it is, uh, privacy by design is, uh, is specifically introduced in, in GDPR, uh, and it is specific to privacy by default obligation, which requires companies to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that by default, only personal data necessary for each specific purpose of the processing are processed. So here, I think what you need to, 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 uh, to understand here uh, sorry uh, what you need to, to to look to understand here is the the companies that are follow or, or are adhering to the uh, gdpr must implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that by default only data that is necessary uh, is collected and for the purpose with which it is needed so companies should take uh, steps not only to limit or minimize the amount of personal data they collect, but also exercise uh, greater controls over the extent to which uh, or to, to their pro to processing of that data. So personal data must by default be kept only for the amount of time uh, uh, to provide the product or service, which means that uh, a limitation of the, the, the time. Also, you need to look at uh, it also, uh, they should uh, not store that data for longer than it is necessary. So that is what specifically by privacy by default is defined in, in uh, the GDPR. How do the company, co companies comply? Now, the principles of privacy by, defines, uh, by design and privacy by default will both have to become integral part of the technological development of any new product, service, or system, so that privacy is key consideration from the onset. So whatever product that you are developing, whatever service that you are going to offer, whatever system that you are going to develop, you must make sure that the privacy is by design, uh, privacy is there by design, 
from the, the time, the, uh, the development phase, from the design phase, the thrive is, 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 is in, in, in that particular pro, uh, product or service. So companies should carefully review and assess their data uh, processing system, as well as their operation gener uh, operations generally to determine whether personal data is appropriately mapped, classified, labeled, uh, stored, accessible in order to allow it to be searched and collected easily in the event of a request by a data subject, either to supply personal info, uh, data or rectify or delete that personal data. These are some of the things that in many of many data protection uh, legislation around the world, the, this, these are clauses that are, are in, in, ingrained in them. So that you must make sure, I remember when we were talking about uh, putting up, uh, putting in place privacy program, what you, you cannot do that without doing your data mapping or you are doing the data inventory. So you must make sure that the personal data is appropriately mapped. It is appropriately classified because one time this person will come and say that I need this data and you need, you need to provide that data um, uh, in a way that they, they need it. And technology move, I said yeah, la, 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 uh, in our last session, technology moves faster than legislation. For example, right now with the data protection um, uh, uh, act, which means that uh, this, this part where we say that in the event a request or by a data subject is either uh, subject either to supply personal data uh, or supply it to a third party. You can find that now uh, uh, when we go uh, come to banking sector, there's what we call open banking, which is, uh, has taken traction in the UK, uh, in, in, the, in Europe, or in, the, in the EU region. And this uh, open banking, what it, it states is that uh, banks should be able to uh, give um, the account information and transactional data of consumers to the third parties with the with the with the consent of the consumers. Okay, so why why is that so? Because uh, they are looking at the GDPR, which says that yeah, if this the, the person needs the data, they should be able to be given because the data that is kept by the bank is not belonging to the bank, but it belongs to the consumer. So if the consumer needs that data uh, to access other alternative fi finance services or manage their their data uh, their financial uh, in in a, 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 a good way because uh, of the fintech then they should be able to get that so it is uh, that's why i'm saying technology is moving very fast faster than uh, the legislation but uh, this uh, legislation which are put in place helps us uh, to be more to get more freedom and get more control of, over our data because we are living in a data centric uh, uh, economy where data is the new fuel, the new currency, and uh, and the new uh, we 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 strive on data. So systems are set up uh, for automated deletion of uh, personal data, which means that if that data has been used, uh, has been collected, and has been used the way it was supposed to be used then you should set your system to automatically delete those data. And here we are talking about secure deletion of that data. So paper-based forms and application or other data collection forms are drafted appropriately to ensure that excessive personal data is not collected because they might not be very easy to, to, to keep. Also, uh, data should be uh, pseudonymized, which means that the data, when uh, you've collected data, they should transfer it in a, a manner that when you they give it to you, you should not be able to make uh, um, um, a meaning of that data. So personal data should also can also be singled out so as to allow for uh, deletion and uh, personal uh, data of individuals who have objected to receiving di direct marketing. Uh, you see the, the always with this, this marketing, the um, uh, marketing uh, set people sending you information anyhow. So if you don't want that, then they should be able to make sure that um, uh, you are exonerated from such kind of messages. 
Oh, personal data is structured in a commonly used machine readable and in interoperable, interoperable format to certify the requirements of data portability. Now, this data portability is something now to, uh, to do with the standardization. How can I be able to, for example, if to today I'm an insurance, you, you are in uh, bogged in an insurance company and um, these guys uh, are charging you uh, exorbitant rates on, on policy and you find uh, another company which has got uh, a very, very favorable, favorable rate. How can your data, because you see data, uh, you have an history, a history in that particular organization. And this history is what you need to, to make sure that you can be able to get uh, for, uh, other facilities from other organizations. So how can this data be taken from this particular organization A to organization B? Sometimes you are uh, you are bogged up with a bank with a, with a very very high overdraft, and you want that your data to be transferred from that particular bank A to bank B. How can that uh, happen? So that is why we we need the data portability, and this data portability in most cases, like when I talk about open banking, uh, talking about um, uh, portability in a standardized manner. So we are talking about uh, uh, a standard. A way of uh, presenting this data. There's also what we call uh, binding corporate rules. This is just something that I wanted just to 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 uh, to uh, add for informational purposes. But if you are an organization, for example, which is uh, um, a multinational, uh, and you want uh, you, you you want uh, uh, make sure that you have. Um, uh, uh, privacy uh, aligned throughout, then you need to use what we call the DCR. The DCR are sometimes called the gold standard of global data protection. They can best be described as privacy framework or code implemented by companies and created to facilitate cross-border uh, transfer of personal data. You don't need to, to look at the existing, uh, may, may, maybe the existing uh, um, uh, 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 applicable legal regula or regulations, but you can implement this BCR within the organization to make sure that you can be able to transfer their data from one one affiliate to the other uh, uh, in a, in, a, in a proper framework. So it allows personal data to move freely between various entities of a corporate group. Remember, this is a corporate group. So if it is uh, ABC companies worldwide, so you the Binding corporate rules just helps you within that particular particular uh, group of companies. So it it allows the data to move freely between various entities of a corporate group by ensuring that the same high level protection of personal in data is com uh, complied with by all members of the group by means of a single set of binding enforceable rules. So this is more of an internal. Um, internal rule within the organization. So BCR compel organization to demonstrate their compliance with all aspects of applicable data uh, protection legislation, uh, thereby demonstrating an, an, an organization accountability. So that brings me to the end of this uh, today's presentation. Um, I think I'll hand it over back to Annabelle uh, to continue from there. Thank you, Mr. Dinga. Thank you for that very insightful presentation. We are now going into our Q&A session. I will begin with, uh, there were a few hands that were raised during the call, well, during your presentation. Uh, I see the hand is still raised. Yes, um, I'm going to request Elsie to, to unmute and ask her question. Elisi, kindly unmute and ask your question. Okay, well, 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 she organizes herself. I'll read some of the questions in the Q and A section. Um, Sardinga, the first question is: How do we differentiate 
between data protection and privacy from confidentiality? Uh, data protection, <clears throat> confidentiality, and privacy. I think this question was asked la 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 last uh, last week, last session. Now, uh, let's 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 start with privacy. Privacy is um, um, uh, making sure that your data, which is collected and 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 uh, and uh, stored by the organization, is done in a proper way. So where normally uh, you can see that when you talk about privacy and uh, and um, and uh, data protection, you use them synonymously. But uh, uh, legally, if you lo look at privacy, is more of the the policies and 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 the legal uh, protection of the personal data, while in the data uh, data uh, protection is more of of uh, protection or more of technical aspects or technical tools to make sure that that data is protected from uh, any breach. So that uh, uh, usually you can use them synonymously, but that is basically the, the difference. Uh, uh, data protection looks more on, on the, the, the technical aspects of protecting that data. Remember when we say that, we say there are two components of privacy. We talked about the collecting of that data, processing of that data. That's more of now the privacy aspect of it. But when we look at the protection aspect of it, the tools, then you are talking about the data protection. Now, when we are talking about data, data can be uh, uh, any data. If I talk about organization, the organization can have data which are, uh, let's say, data about uh, about uh, the, their systems, data data about their marketing strategy, data about their whatever data in the organization. However, when you are talking about data that is uh, inclined to a, a natural person, then that is where uh, 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 private privacy comes. The P the PII, the, the personally identified information. But when you just talk about uh, making sure that you pro, uh, that data is only available to people who are supposed to know it, that's what we call the confidentiality. So confidentiality is more about keeping the secret secret. Okay, if you look at it from the information security point of view, keeping the secret secret. Now, if that information that you are keeping secret belongs to a natural person. Then it, it touches on privacy. I, think, I don't know whether I'm clear there. Yes, you are clear, Mr. Dinga. Uh, the next question is What is the mission and vision in the context of privacy in an organization? Now, uh, any, when uh, any organization will have their mission and vision, uh, and uh, this is always articulated very much, very well when you go to any website. These are our mission, these are our vision. Okay. Now, when it comes to, to privacy, you see, you are now talking about protection of personally identifiable information. Now, uh, and for you to, to do this, you need to put in place what we call the privacy program management. Now, for you to have effective pro privacy, program management in place, then you need to have what is the vision of this uh, privacy management program? What are, we, what are we looking to achieve? What kind of data that are we going to pro protect? Because you might find that within those personally inform, uh, the identifiable inform OPII, there are some data which are very much um, uh, need, needed to be protected according to the value that they uh, they, 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 they have. So you need to have this in uh, pri uh, th this privacy vision and mission uh, uh, in place for you to have an appropriate and um, um, uh, proper privacy program in place. So once you have the vision, vision tells you this is what you, you want to do and this is where we uh, maybe this uh, our eventually eventually this is what we we want to achieve. Now, the, your mission statement will just 
show uh, put in few words uh, for the person to, to for the uh, customers whatever to, un to understand what is it that you stand for in in this particular privacy uh, management program so in the context of a privacy management pro program it is just uh, the vision and mission statements are just there to enhance and to make sure that you can put in place a proper privacy uh, program in place thank you mr dinga uh, the next question is can we add data protection in labor contracts? Um, I don't, uh, uh, labor contract, what do you mean? Uh, what does he mean by labor contracts? I think in this sense, he means maybe something like employment contracts, contracts signed by employees, between employers and employees. Usually, usually, usually mm -hmm. when you go to an organization, uh, you will have a contract in place. Okay, and I, I think the contract should always have the standard clauses of the contract. However, when you are uh, you now start getting uh, you get into that organization, then you need to to adhere to the to the um, uh, if the if the, this issue of the data protection, then you have to they, they, they'll have a policy about that data protection uh, how and how it is it is it is supposed to be. A, a, a adhered to within the organization and this is why i was talking about the, the policies so when before you start using the system within that organization you need to uh, uh, to uh, uh, accept to the, the the policies and there are so, so many policies that within the organization depending on the structure of the organization that you need to go through and ma make sure that you you uh, assign you, ass you assign those those policies that you uh, you have already read and understood and one of those policies is maybe something like acceptable use policy okay how uh, acceptable use policy it could be an overarching policy which tells you what systems that you are going to be using or how you are going to be using those systems what you are supposed to do and what you are not supposed to do so I don't think it will be necessary to in, ingrain that in uh, uh, the, 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 the aspect of data protection in an employment contract, but rather uh, you the sign the employment contract, then from when you get into the organization, then you'll be able to sign other policies that you need to follow, including those data protection policies. That's my take. Thank you, Mr. Dinga. Uh, next question is, what happens if the company activates automatic deletion of personal data but might need the use of the data in, at a future date? Now, that one depends. That is still go, goes back to, to the policy. Um, uh, because when you are putting the, uh, uh, designing the policy, and you 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 know that we'll be collecting this data and this data should be used for this particular purpose and this data should be uh, <clears throat> should be uh, kept for this certain period of time so what happened is that you can do that automatically as we will go to to see the last our last uh, in our last um, uh, presentation we look at how you can automate uh, what tools can you use to you automate these privacy aspects? So what happened is that you can be able to automate that to make sure that this certain uh, category of data uh, can be deleted after this uh, this period of time, which is stipulated on the on 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 that uh, when you are collecting that data. So it is only if you if you delete it uh, mistakenly. Uh, then I, you should just have um, other uh, technical mechanism to ensure that you can uh, uh, get the data back. But otherwise, you can only automate according to the policy that you put in place and according to what is, is required, what was required when you are putting that data in, 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 in place. For example, if you take uh, uh, process personal data and you know that you will be able, you'll, you'll still need that data. 
you see you might it might force you to need to to look for consent again from the 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 the, the, the data subject so that you can keep on uh, keeping on that uh, keeping that data but otherwise um uh, if it is set uh, for automatic automatic deletion then if that criteria is met the, the data will automatically be deleted i don't think there's not, not much there's much you can do about that thank you mr dinga i'm going to move away from the q and a section and go to the raised hands uh denise unmute and ask your question denise Okay, um, Denise is not admitting. Um, I see Elisi. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Kindly unmute and, and ask your question. Okay, she's not unmuting. I'm just going to go to the chat section now. There is a comment here. Um, Gladness wants to know what the the issue of privacy how the issue of privacy applies to all east african countries and if so does it differ to those countries that include the laws governing privacy please explain how it differs i i, I don't think there's privacy for east african and privacy for other 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 parts of the world i think privacy remains privacy and it depends on that that particular organization uh, per country about the the legislation that they put to take <coughs> sorry to take into consideration the policies the, the the privacy so i don't know what you mean by saying that uh, the difference between east african policy uh, privacy and other organization uh, other countries but <coughs> what is happening is that like in kenya we have the data protection laws which is taking care of uh, the issue of privacy in uh, in uganda i think there's also uh, the data protection laws yes, uh, around the world there's also the gdpr in 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 the us there's various privacy laws uh, according to the states so <clears throat> they don't differ they only they they they, they take into consideration the aspect of uh, personal information protection. So I don't see any difference between East African privacy in the context of the, the other world uh, privacy uh, 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 mechanisms. Uh, I think Gladness wanted to know if the issue of privacy applies to all East African countries. And I think you've answered those other question. Most East African countries have data protection laws. So I would yeah, think it's a yeah, human yeah, privacy yeah. is the same. Uganda has data protection laws, Kenya has, Rwanda has, Burundi. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most cases you find that all these, these laws, if you look at them carefully, they are <clears throat> emanating from the GDPR. Exactly. In most, of, uh, uh, most uh, uh, respect, they are GDPR, just localized. That's true. Okay, so uh, I think that is all we have. If there is anyone with a question you feel hasn't uh, that hasn't been asked and you want to get an answer, kindly raise your hand or send your question in the chat room. We still have a few minutes. Uh, oh yes, Gladness is uh, saying that they have gotten the, cl the, the clarity that they need. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Um, any raised hands? Feel free to raise your hands or ask a question if you have. Okay. I don't think we have any more questions. Mr. Dinga, I want to thank you for today's session. It was very insightful and we learned a lot i want to believe well at least from what i'm seeing in the chat section a lot of people are, are really glad and happy about your presentation um so i thank you for 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 the time that you have given us 
we cannot wait to hear you uh, hear your presentation for our next session. Please note that we have one more part, um, the last part of this of this webinar series, which will be on data assessments on the 25th of January 2022. Please mark that they save that date. Uh, the session will also begin on the, at two and end at four. 25th January 2020 um, from two to four. Um, also, that will be our last session, and it is after that session that um, the certificates will be awarded. I want to thank everyone that has joined on the call to listen in to Mr. Dinga. Uh, we are glad that you, you, you are attended and that you are active in the, in the comment section and the Q&A section and for sending in your questions. Uh, the presentation and recording of this will be sent to your emails if you registered for this call, if everyone who's on this call registered, you will, re you will be receiving an email um, sharing uh, the presentation and, and, and um, the recording for today. Thank you very much, Mr. Dinga, for today. I thank you everyone for attending. On behalf of the ELS and myself, I enjoy your afternoon and have a good, uh, have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the for ELS and uh, as well as the attendance. Uh, let's meet again on 25th for the last session. If, um, I've covered uh, the data protect the, the uh, data assessment, but um, uh, next week we'll be uh, looking at data protect uh, privacy from the uh, personal data security point of view. So. Yeah, I hope to see you then. Thank you. Thanks.